Christmas at Red Butte by L. M. Montgomery. Part two. But I want to sit up until Mother comes home, objected Jimmy. You can't. She may be very late, for she would have to wait to see Mr. Porter. Besides, you don't know what time Santa Claus might come, if he comes at all. If he were to drive along and see you children up instead of being sound asleep in bed, he might go right on and never call at all. This argument was too much for Jimmy. All right, we'll go. But we have to hang up our stockings first. Twins, get yours. The twins toddled off in great excitement and brought back their Sunday stockings, which Jimmy proceeded to hang along the edge of the mantel shelf. This done, they all trooped obediently off to bed. Theodora gave another sigh and seated herself at the window, where she could watch the moonlit prairie for Mrs. Martin's homecoming and knit at the same time. I'm afraid that you will think from all this sighing Theodora was doing that she was a very melancholy and despondent young lady. You couldn't think anything more unlike the real Theodora. She was the jolliest, bravest girl of 16 in all Saskatchewan, as her shining brown eyes and rosy dimpled cheeks would have told you. And her sighs were not on her own account, but simply for the fear that the children were going to be disappointed. She knew that they would be almost heartbroken if Santa Claus did not come, and this would hurt the patient, hardworking little mother more than all else. Five years before this, Theodora had come to live with Uncle George and Aunt Elizabeth in the little log house at Red Butte. Her own mother had just died, and Theodora had only her big brother Donald left, and Donald had Klondike fever. The Martins were poor, but they had gladly made room for their little niece, and Theodora had lived there ever since. Her aunt's right-hand girl and the beloved playmate of the children. They had been very happy until Uncle George's death two years before this Christmas Eve. But since then, there had been hard times in the little log house, and though Mrs. Martin and Theodora did their best, it was a woefully hard task to make both ends meet, especially this year when their crops had been poor. Theodora and her aunt had made every sacrifice possible for the children's sake, and at least Jimmy and the twins had not felt the pinch very severely yet. At seven, Mrs. Martin's bells jingled at the door, and Theodora flew out. Go right in and get warm, Auntie, she said briskly. I'll take Ned away and unharness him. It's bitterly cold night, said Mrs. Martin wearily. There was a note of discouragement in her voice that struck dismay to Theodora's heart. I'm afraid it means no Christmas for the children tomorrow, she thought sadly as she led Ned away to the stable. When she returned to the kitchen, Mrs. Martin was sitting by the fire, her face in her chilled hands, sobbing convulsively. Auntie, oh, Auntie, don't, exclaimed Theodora impulsively. It was such a rare thing to see her plucky, resolute little aunt in tears. You're cold and tired. I'll have a nice cup of tea for you in a trice. No, it isn't that said Mrs. Martin brokenly. It was seeing those stockings hanging there, Theodora. I couldn't get a thing for the children, not a single thing. Mr. Porter would only give $40 for the colt, and when all the bills were paid, there was barely enough left for such necessaries as we must have. I suppose I ought to feel thankful I could get those, but the thought of the children's disappointment tomorrow is more than I can bear. It would have been better to have told them long ago, but I kept bil building on getting more for the colt. Well, it's weak and foolish to give way like this. We'd better both take a cup of tea and go to bed. It will save fuel. End of part two. So, 
What do we know now and how have our perceptions changed? Well, we learn that Theodora is an orphan. She has a brother named Donald who has Klondike fever. It's not an actual fever. It's the Klondike gold rush was happening at this time in Canada. And Donald had gold fever, the itch to get rich. So he wasn't sick. He just went to the Klondike to uh, search for gold. So the Martins took Theodora, who was about 11 years old or so, took her in as one of their own family and loved her. The little kids loved her. She was the right hand to her aunt. So then Uncle George, Mr. Martin, passes away. That happened two years ago. And ever since, Theodora and Mrs. Martin have sacrificed and worked in spite of great sadness and hardship. It tells us straight out they're having trouble making ends meet. So how does this make us feel as readers? Well, it makes us fall in love more with these kids and this family. They are showing love to each other in hard times. It tugs on our heartstrings. We realize that they've been through a lot and that they are worthy of getting some kind of a break, and we hope that they do. But it's not looking good at this point. Mrs. Martin breaks down at the sight of the Christmas stockings. So to her, those stockings represent that cheerful expectation that she herself played into. And now that cheerful expectation of Santa, of gifts, of good food is going to be dashed. And she is heartbroken that she could not make this Christmas happen for her kids. But even still, she refuses to indulge in too much emotion. So even at the conclusion of her crying, mother says, you know, it will save fuel. She basically says, well, make a cup of tea and go to bed, which means that Thoughts of frugality, saving money are never far from her mind. So one interesting thing that I noticed was that Montgomery addresses the reader as you. And she as a narrator is not too much of a character in this story. But I thought perhaps this is just to give the flavor of a fireside tale, like the one Theodora herself might have told the kids. So what are we curious about now and where do we think the story is headed? So I'm thinking that Theodora has a role to play. She seems to be the one that we're tracking the most so far. She's been in every scene. The kids can do nothing to make a good Christmas happen. Mrs. Martin has done all she can. And so as readers, we suspect that Theodora will be the next to take action since the others can't. So we shall see how it all turns out in part three. I will see you tomorrow. Tomorrow.